Here we're going to look at pattern recognition. So if I have a bunch of shapes here, um, can you recognize them as any particular objects? If I kind of move that shape over, now it looks like I have a mug and a suitcase here. Another example of pattern recognition is if you're looking at a bunch of a uh, patch of clover, um, can you pick out the four-leaf clover if there's one there? Can you recognize that pattern, how it differs from what's around it despite the similarities? So getting more de details of pattern recognition, well, it can be an object or an event. So object examples would be eye color, handwriting, fingerprints. These are all um, can get into certain patterns. There's also gestures or routines can be a pattern that we may be able to see or recognize with certain people. Uh, patterns in everyday life, so how do they relate? Well, loan and credit card applications, uh, income dependence uh, to determine whether the cr someone is worthy of getting that credit. That's a pattern. How, how are they behaving over time? Dating services use age, hobbies, height to determine desirability. That's another pattern. And online pages, when we keyword search descriptions to find documents, that's looking for a pattern in a particular document or text block. Uh, pattern recognition applications. Well, pattern recognition is used to give human identification uh, intelligence to machines, which required for image processing. It's used to extract features from a given video or image samples that can also um, use as a computer. This is where artificial intelligence can come in and pick out the faces and be able to uh, analyze those faces and compare them to a data bank, for example. That's an example of pattern recognition. Um, also, similar objects, classifying uh, them into different classes or subgroups. For example, we have the large population looking at males versus females. That's one way of classifying um, it, it, the people in this image. Uh, we could be looking at a whole multitude of ways of recognizing similarity of objects. Methods of pattern classification, well, we can separate data belonging to different classes. When new data comes in, we need to classify into a category. So if we're looking at, you know, red versus uh, blue uh, fruits versus the black, if we have another strawberry come in and we're looking at that's going to be red, if we have an apple come in, if that's a red apple, we're going to classify that um, and have a method of putting that in a separate case or class. There's variability. There's intra and interclass uh, variability. Intra class, different typefaces of the letter T. If we go down, look at the different T, that'd be intra. Interclass variability would be letters and numbers that look similar. So, for example, the letter B and the number 8. It's an interclass variability. They look uh, very similar. Versus here, they're all the letter T, but they have different typefaces. So, they're intraclass variability. There's some of the challenges we have when we're looking at how do we class certain things. Classification versus clustering. Well, classification is recognition. We have our clustering. So, here's our classification of low-risk consumers and high-risk consumers, and we can cluster them as these little, as these groups here. Um, it just helps us to determine um, when we get new data, where would that most likely fit, or what can we kind of uh, gain from that new data that comes in. License plate recognition is one example, um, is where an automatic number plate recognition can be used to store the images captured by cameras, as well as a text from the license plate with some um, configurability to store this photograph of the driver. So we kind of have that connection between that license plate and either that car, that time, and potentially even going to that driver. Uh, it can be important for crime scene investigation. We're looking at tracing where someone went. Uh, license plate recognition is very important for pattern recognition. We also have fingerprint classification. We have five categories, arches, tinted arches, ulnar loops, radial loops, whirls. All these can be a way of identifying certain patterns and classifying them and comparing them to a known set or database. We have face detection. That's a computer that identifies human faces in digital images. This can also be used with face detection uh, software within cameras, potentially for focusing and things like that. Um, so this can be automatic as well. Medical applications, this can be important. Uh, where skin cancer detection, what's the normal, what's not, what fits into what pattern. Being able to recognize something that looks different is important, and these are all kind of evidence of potential um, skin cancers just based on the image here, depicted in all these different sizes, different uh, than a freckle, for example, or a mole. Uh, conveyor belts, they also have pattern recognition. These are typically um, computer-based, but they can also be human-based. Whereas optical sorters can recognize objects' color, uh, size, its shape, structural or chemical composition, can allocate it into different areas. This can be achieved in a non-destructive 100% inspection in line at full production volumes, allowing us to ensure we're having consistent product coming out, or we're allocating out into different areas, different sizes, or different colors. Um, a lot of this can be done with automation and optical eyes, um, but this is important that those computers 
can recognize patterns. Now from patterns we can have feature extraction. So let's assume a fisherman told us uh, that a sea bass is generally larger, or I should say longer, than a salmon. Here's a sea bass, here's a salmon. We can use length as a feature and decide between sea bass and salmon according to the threshold on length. So how should we sh choose the th threshold? We need to accumulate some data at least initially. So here's our length histogram looking at different um, the fish here. Uh, even though the sea bass is longer uh, than salmon on the average, there are some there are many examples in this case where the fish this does not hold true. So here's our salmon, here's our sea bass. We can see that there's definitely some indications where there are some longer salmon um, than sea bass and some longer sea bass than, than salmon in some cases. But we develop that threshold. Where's that kind of breaking point that we can kind of say most of the time it's true for one or the other. So average lightness of the histogram, well looking here, it seems easier to choose the threshold at x, but we still cannot make this perfect decision. So here we're seeing this is most likely where the salmon are going to be um, different than the sea bass. We have that average lightness, or looking at different kind of colorations. And we can see it doesn't always hold true, but we can see there's definitely an area here where most of the time that does hold true. Uh, Multi-featured, so this can improve recognition accuracy. Instead of just using one of those features, we can have multiple features. We might be able to use more than one. Single features may not yield the best performance. Using a combination of these features may yield better performance. Kind of like a Swiss Army knife, it's kind of got a bunch of different things. It's multi-featured. It can be used in a variety of situations. Using our past example, we can use the lightness or the coloration, as well as the width or the length of those fish in physical size. How many features do we include? Well, this gets interesting. Uh, does adding more features always improve its performance? Well, more is not always better. There could be redundancy or overcomplication to occur. So we have a little far side Gary Larson cartoon. Uh, pull out, pull out, hit an artery, right? It's getting too much blood in this case. There's a certain point that there's that ideal amount, but then if you go over and above, you can actually cause a negative feature to occur or get less useful data from that. So we classify things. How do we classify things? <laughs> Partition the feature space into two regions by finding the decision boundary that minimizes error. Notice that this says minimize error. It doesn't necessarily eliminate error. We should find the optimal decision boundary. So how do we go about finding this boundary of our classification? We have a complexity model. Perfect classification for performance on training data is possible by choosing a more complex model. However, this can lead to overfitting the data. So it, instead of our just simple line, technically there's some of those pink dots over here and some of the black dots here. Well, if we overfit that model and get too complex, well, we'd kind of create this little crazy line here. Um, not probably the best case, not really useful data. We kind of want where it's mostly true. It doesn't always have to be true. This is overfitting the data. It has to mostly be true. So a lot of times that we perform that generalization, we produce that kind of that simpler model. So generalization is defined by the ability to, cl to classify or produce the correct results on novel patterns. How can we improve the generalization of the performance? Well, more training examples, better model estimates. The simpler models usually yield better performance. So again, while the complex model may be accurate just about all the time, the simpler model makes a lot more sense. It's accurate most of the time. So when we're looking at generalizing for a pattern, it may not work 100% of the time, but in this case, it's very easy to see with new data that may come in where we would classify that. I just gave you a random data point and said, is that most likely a salmon or a sea bass? And the point ended in this region. You say it's more likely to be a sea bass. If it was in this region, more likely to be a salmon. Because of this simpler delineation model, it makes it a lot easier. Here with this complex model, we kind of get lost and kind of glean less information in total. So generalization, be careful with how general you make certain statements, but in many cases they can yield a more simpler model that can potentially have better results when trying to classify new data.